Up next, we have Natalia Komarova. Um, she's the Chancellor's Professor of Mathematics at the University of California, Irvine, and she's going to be speaking about mathematical modeling of cancer evolution. Welcome, Natalia. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Today in the short presentation, I will talk uh, about mainly two things. So these are the take home messages and uh, they're both about using mathematics to study evolutionary processes in the context of cancer. The first message is about the co-evolution of cancer and host. Uh, mathematically, we, cal we can calculate the speed of evolution and uh, we can show that the very hierarchical structure of tissue uh, perhaps has evolved uh, as the evolution's response to the threat of cancer. And the second message is about the complexity of the uh, cancer microenvironment that has been emphasized before at this conference. Uh, I'll show you uh, that uh, this complexity actually is responsible for the changing of the very laws of evolution. So evolution inside cancer may uh, have some very special laws. So uh, yes, cancer is an evolutionary process and uh, it's a branch of mathematics to study evolution. Uh, I will uh, give an example of a, a, a progression uh, of normal epithelium to colon cancer uh, to illustrate the concept of two important types of genetic change that uh, happens during evolution. Uh, one type of mutations is a loss of function mutations and the other one is a gain of function. Both of them are represented in colorectal cancer. So uh, loss of function is exemplified by a tumor suppressor gene like the APC gene. Uh, and the gain of function uh, is a, a type of an oncogene. So what's the difference? A gain of function mutation is a mutation that gives a cell an advantage. So a cell may stop dying, start dividing faster, refuses to cooperate, uh, all these things that lead to an increased proliferation of the cell. And uh, this is one of the characteristics of some oncogenes. Loss of function mutation works differently Normally, it's a two-step process. Uh, in a tumor suppressor gene, when the first copy of the gene is inactivated, nothing much happens. Perhaps the phenotype even is weaker than the original phenotype. And only the loss of the second copy of the gene actually confers uh, a fitness advantage to the cell, creating this super mutant that has an increased uh, proliferation rate. So APC is one example, retinoblastoma, about 200 of those genes have been discovered that play an important role in different cancers. So the two types of genetic change require different approaches. So when we talk about uh, gain of function mutations, we talk about mutant extinction, invasion and fixation, basically whether a mutant can spread and take over the organ or part of the organ. When we talk about um, a loss of function gene, uh, it makes sense to speak about the um, speed of evolution. You start from a wild type gene, then you have to go through a, a fitness valley where this first copy is mutated and it gives you actually an evolutionary disadvantage. And it takes a long evolutionary time to actually create, the, to, to come up with a second mutation that brings the uh, fitness up. So uh, the crossing of this fitness valley defines the speed of evolution and can be a proxy for uh, the, the speed of uh, cancer progression. So how do we model evolutionary processes in tissue? So we simplify, right? We simplify to different degrees. I'll start with the simplest and go build it up. So this is the simplest process, a bunch of cells in the box. You kill one, you divide one, and you'll watch the spread of the mutant. In this process, there is a mathematical way that we found that characterizes the speed of evolution. You can uh, calculate how quickly uh, you can expect the creation of the super gene, of the super mutant that, uh, for example, is uh, an inactivation of both copies of a tumor suppressor gene. You can calculate it based on the population size and mutation rate. Now let's move into a spatial model. Now we kill one, and only replace it with one of the neighbors. This is a simplified 
uh, notion of a spatial evolution, calculate the rate of evolution in a spatial environment, and it turns out to be faster. So somehow spatial um, factors, spatial restrictions speed up evolution. And this happens, of course, and also in 2D and 3D. Uh, the reason for that is that weak intermediate mutants stick together and only have to compete with each other. So it makes their life easier and evolution faster. Hierarchical tissues, there are stem cells and their intermediate uh, transit amplifying cells, differentiated cells, kill one layer, divide them, this is the process. And it turns out in, that, uh, in a tissue that uh, has this hierarchical structure, evolution is slower. So it's the, the rate of evolution is highest in spatially restricted uh, non-hierarchical tissue. And it's the slowest in a tissue that consists of stem cells and their lineages. So uh, this may be uh, an explanation of why uh, a lot of our organs have this hierarchical structure. It helps an organism to delay the onset of cancer beyond the age of reproduction. So the second topic that I briefly cover is randomness, evolution and random environments. So let me refer to a very well-known law of genetics. If we have a neutral mutant, a mutant that has the same properties as the wild type, its probability of invasion or fixation is given by its initial frequency. You start with one out of N cells uh, that is the same as everybody else. The probability that it invades is exactly one over N. So here, what I want to do, I want to make the fitness of cells depend on their spatial location. So in this caricature, I distribute sun and water randomly throughout space. And that uh, it, uh, kind of tells you that the fitness of the mutants and wild type cells depends on where they are. Okay, and you will see where I'm getting at uh, shortly. So, and this is distributed randomly without giving any advantage to the mutant. So there could be configurations where the mutant that is completely advantageous, disadvantageous, or none of the above. When you average over all of these different realizations, you don't expect a mutant to be advantageous and you expect the normal law of evolution to hold. So, uh, on average, there is no advantage uh, or disadvantage to the mutants, so we expect the probability of fixation to be exactly equal to the initial frequency. So here, here comes my favorite story. We tried to calculate the probability of mutant fixation where uh, the population is only three cells, right? And we got the probability one third. So exactly like predicted by the normal theory of evolution. Then we tried it with n equals four, uh, so if it was like predicted by the, your normal genetic theory, uh, probability of fixation times four would be a straight line here. But we got a slight deviation from that law. You see, it's really tiny, less than the tenth of a percent. And then we increased the population size, five cells, eight cells, 10 cells. And look at that. The deviation from the horizontal line becomes bigger and bigger which means that the effect is increasing. Uh, the population of 200 cells, 10 to the three cells. Look at that. The uh, probability of fixation is 15 times higher than what is predicted by your conventional evolutionary theory. So this effect is not so small and it grows with the population size. And this happens both on uh, uh, this uh, circular geometry, which uh, uh, was our first attempt, and on, in all sorts of other graphs in space and two-dimensional, three-dimensional space. So mutants without any evolutionary advantage in a random environment behave as if they are selected for. Their probability of fixation is significantly larger than what's predicted by a usual evolutionary theory. And the effect increases with population size. And this only happens if the mutants start as a minority. So somehow we came up with this law that minority rules, right? So why do we ever consider a circle? Just a short, uh, so look at the uh, picture of colony crypts. These are folds of tissues. Uh, take a horizontal cross section, you get a circle. But of course this holds for two, three, uh, 2D and 3D. 
and what's what's the deal for cancer so uh, as mentioned before ca uh, cancers tumor microenvironment is very important it's very complex and it's characterized by uh, heterogeneities uh, it includes trauma uh, blood blood vessels all sorts of cells the distribution of oxygen and hypoxic regions uh, are uh, non-homogeneous the nutrients are distributed in, in a complex fashion it's very important where you are inside the tumor there are sweet spots there are bad spots uh, there are all sorts of cells that participate in the building of a tumor inflammatory mediators micro uh, macrophages stromal cells all these non-tumorous cells that somehow participate so the population of non-malignant cells contribute to the formation of rich and heterogeneous tumor env environment. And so what I have shown you is that the very laws of evolution are actually made different by the presence of this randomness or stochasticity of uh, the environment. Depending on where you are in a tumor, your fitness may be different. And that makes minority mutants that don't have any intrinsic advantage it makes them advantageous they behave as if they're advantageous so it kind of uh, speeds up uh, the all the processes so a classical genetic theory classical theory of evolution does not really work or only works approximately when we talk about tumors and we need this new mathematical methods to study uh, evolution in tumors so let, just uh, uh, to explain intuitively why is it that minority mutants uh, have an edge in tumors? So let's suppose we have this environment uh, where orange is a good spot. And we start with two mutants, a minority. And let they spread and they kind of explore the environment. And uh, you can see that in this configuration, they uh, increased the numbers and they took all the good spots. So the average fitness of mutants has increased as time goes by. Now start from a majority cell. So wild type is a majority. It's distributed, it's more than a half, okay? Try to redistribute that to increase their average fitness. So on average, there are as many good spots as there are bad spots. So you cannot possibly redistribute a majority such that its uh, fitness increases on average. So a majority loses and minority wins. So that's why the, uh, this is a simple intuitive explanation of why uh, minorities are advantageous in uh, non-homogeneous random environments. So uh, the main, uh, I guess the main message from this talk is that there are few things that are more fascinating than mathematics of evolution. I want to thank my group and the support. Uh, and uh, these are a couple of books that we wrote on uh, mathematical methods of uh, cancer modeling, which include these and other topics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalia, for an excellent uh, presentation. Um, I don't have uh, any questions, but uh, what you said uh, totally um, lays out the very complexity. And as you were speaking, I was thinking you're talking about outside the environment, outside the cell. We haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's inside the cell, in terms of a whole new set of uh, dimension we can go off in in terms of mitochondria, for example. No one has talked about that whole area yet. And there are so many things we can explore. We are going to have a full panel discussion with all the speakers in a few minutes. So there are no questions for you now, Natalia, but I'm sure we will have a few for you coming up. So I'm going to turn over to Tamara to take us to the next speaker now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.